Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Today's reading comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the layering on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. This morning I am joined by my wife, Jamelin, uh, who is obviously mother to our two children, uh, Margaret and Nathan, and two C sections, two C-sections, as she reminded us. Uh, and um, and I always think it's good on Mother's Day, especially to hear the perspective of a mom. So uh, we're going to start with those. That, that video we showed earlier uh, is a clear homage to those progressive commercials, the one where homeowners are becoming their parents. And 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 if you've never seen those commercials, again. Google it, like LOL, it's kind of out there. Anyway, so the, 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 the idea is that the leader of the support group, Dr. Rick, takes people to different situations, whether it's restaurants or grocery stores or hardware stores or elevators, and tries to help them know how not to act like their parents, right? Which I, I really personally don't expect, understand what you expect people to do in elevators. I mean, are we just supposed to stand there not talk to anybody, don't ask them where they're from, what they're doing that day, what their social security number is. Am I just supposed to stand there and listen to the deans on each floor and then get out in silence? Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I can testify, having gone on many a vacation together, I am amazed at how quickly Jamelin will charm people in elevators and on buses. We almost got a free car. We almost got a free car one. once. I met like the <laughs> or dealer. Or at least a discounted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so she's, you know, so yes, but that you are supposed to just well, be quiet. Well, I have my own little progressive commercial. I was um, taking Margaret to school and we're driving along Zionsville Road and this very tall man is walking a dog on a leash. The, the dog had to be this big, and, and I'm not even exaggerating. It was teeny tiny. Its legs were probably this tall, and it was on a leash. And I'm like, where's the dog going to go? But then I was like, what kind of dog is that? And as fate would have it, as fate would have when it. I got to the stoplight, we caught up with the tall man. And so I went to go hit the window, because he's right there. And Margaret goes, no, mom. <laughs> And I said, what? I just, he's here, we're here, don't you wanna know? And she goes, you're acting like Nana. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about that, I think, is my favorite part is Margaret saying, no, mom, like you're a, like a bad dog. Like, yes. you know, like no. Trust me, it felt like that. <laughs> like as rubbing well. your nose in it, yeah, you know. Uh -huh. It, it reminds me of like when I was a kid, the thing that my mom would do that would embarrass us to death is like if we went through the drive through and something was wrong, like I, I mean like, you know, there was mustard on something or whatever it was, like 
just keep driving and go on. We'll scrape the mustard off. And the mom always pulled over, went inside the restaurant, and my brother and I would like sink down <laughs> as low as we could because we just hated to be like everyone to know that's our mom. And so anyways, I think we all have stuff that our mothers did that would embarrass us. And even the worst part is now that we're adults, we turn around and we do those things that were once embarrassing to us or that we embarrass our kids. But we want to kind of turn this all around and kind of think, yeah, there are those moments. We all have them. That's the sense of those progressive commercials. But I think there's also a sense in which there are, you know, the traits and the influences that live in us from our mothers, that they can be a blessing. And in fact, you know, a foundation for our blessing. And that's what we're talking about this whole month. The month of May is the art of blessing. That's our theme. And last week, uh, I, I shared with you the definition of blessing that we got from John Ortberg. The blessing isn't just a word, it's the projection of good into the life of another. The projection of good into the life of another. And, the, you know, blessing isn't just a word. It's not just something casual you say, like, you know, after someone sneezes, bless you. Like, that's not a blessing. Blessing is when we're completely aligned. Our thoughts, our feelings, our words, our actions, our will, everything oriented towards the good of someone else and the, you know, their well-being in the presence of God. And I thought, well, who else embodies that kind of blessing, that total body and life commitment better than moms? And so we want to look at those blessings that we have received from our mothers and how those are the foundation for our own lives, which allow us then to be able to bless others. So this was certainly true for Timothy. Um, He was one of the very early church leaders. And in the opening section of the second letter to Timothy, Paul affirms where Timothy's faith came from. Now, Paul wasn't shy to also mention part of it came from him. He took a little credit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Going so far to call Paul his beloved son or beloved child of sorts. But he also says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith which lived First, in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. So Timothy had a front row seat to see his grandma and his mom living out their faith in all of the work they did each day. And then he now is using that foundation of blessings that he saw with them in his own ministry as a leader in the church. So who are Lois and Eunice, you might ask? What do we know about their faith that makes it unique or spectacular? Well, we only know a very little bit, in fact. We first encounter uh, Timothy in the book of Acts, um, one of Paul's missionary journeys. He's traveling through the region of Lystra, which is a section of Turkey in and around Ephesus. And as he's journeying around Lystra, he comes across a man named Timothy, who's already a disciple, a believer, and it says he's the son of a Jewish woman, who was a believer, that's Eunice, even though her name isn't there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Scandal. Scandal. Literally, like we just read over that as if it's nothing, but in that day it was everything. The idea that a Jewish woman would marry a Greek man, a Gentile, that would have made You know, that's not just crossing over like ethnic boundaries, but crossing over religious boundaries, covenant law. It would have made Eunice unclean. She would have been excluded, cast out of the community of faith. Her son, Timothy, would have been of mixed race, mixed ethnicity. And because of that, he would not have been embraced within the community of faith. In fact, we know he was not circumcised as a child of the covenant. Why do we know this? Because a few verses later in Acts, it says that Paul had to take him and get him circumcised. Why? So that he could be a minister among the Jews in the region, because all the Jews knew his dad was Greek. So unless he was circumcised, he couldn't go into the synagogues. He couldn't witness and, 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 and be a, a leader to them. So. The point is, is this, is that marrying a Greek man would have been extremely costly to Eunice and to her family. They would have been excluded from the community of faith. It would have been very easy for Eunice to give up on her faith. And yet that's not at all what happened. Instead, she nurtured 
faith in herself and that faith in her son so that someday when Paul came around preaching the message of Jesus Christ, they had open arms, uh, open hearts to receive it. And, and, and the gifts and the faith that she nurtured in Timothy would enable him to become a leader of the early church. Think of how incredible that is, that a child of family excluded from the synagogue, from the community of the Jewish faith, would one day become a leader of the early church. That's a testament to Eunice and to her mother Lois. So now that we know the background, the behind the scenes part of this, we have to ask why was Paul mentioning this in the beginning of his letter to Timothy? Um, We want to focus on three words that Paul mentions when he says to Timothy, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. And then he says, God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. So Paul says that these three traits came from the laying on of hands when Timothy received the call to ministry. But we really believe that Timothy had already witnessed these three things in the blessings that he saw his, his mom and his grandma sharing and showering other people in the community and that he watched as he began to understand what ministry would look like for him. So let's take them one at a time. Um, Let's start with power. Paul says, you didn't get a spirit of cowardice or timidity, but a spirit of power. So what was going on in that moment of time that, that required Timothy to have power? Well, the church in Ephesus has a long history uh, in in the Bible. Paul spent two years with the church of Ephesus while he was on his missionary journeys. He felt very close to them. They were near and dear to his heart. Uh, Acts 20 records his tearful goodbye, how they all wept over each other when when they finally separated. Like, it was a church that was near and dear to Paul's heart, but it was also a very challenging church. Uh, between the book of Revelation and Timothy's, you know, the letters to Timothy, they give us a picture of a church, first off, that was declining in passion. The book of Revelation says, you've forgotten your first love and you, you've, you've wandered away. Now, on top of that, one, part of what was feeding, perhaps, into the loss of passion was the, there's divisions and quarreling within. Um, and Paul talks extensively about they were fighting with each other over these senseless, trivial uh, theological debates about the resurrection and about, you know, and he, and he says, you know, the, they've just become a spirit of quarrel. Uh, they were quarrelsome people. And then on top of that, they lived in a context that was increasingly materialistic and self-centered. Paul says for people are lovers of, uh, lovers of money and lovers of pleasure before they're lovers of God. And so you see that kind of pulling people away from the church. Thankfully, we don't have any of these problems with the church no. anymore. So, so glad those so, days are behind us. So Just thankful so we like, don't have to deal with any really of that doing great. stuff, right? But the point is, is, I mean, the church, being the leader of that kind of a church was challenging, and Timothy needed power. Now, to complicate everything, Timothy was a young man, a young pastor, a young leader, and, and so when you're a young leader confronting big problems where power is involved, you know, I think one temptation for Timothy might have been to to be deferent, you know, to those in authority, to to let them walk all over him. And Paul counsels him, he says, don't let anyone look down on you for your youth. Don't let anyone despise you, but set an example for others. So, so, you know, I wish for you power. But he also says, you know, I think the second temptation if the pendulum swung the whole different way would be like to power himself, to puff himself up, you know, and, and swing around his authority and walk all over others. And Paul tells him, don't do that either. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. So the power that, that Paul is speaking of is not like a, an, an arrogant, coercive, push people around power. It, it's rather a, an inward confidence, uh, you know, a, a foundation uh, of confidence and that, that gives you an, an in, internal sense of power. Does that make sense? Sure. Sounds great. <laughs> power then is the first. Right. But then the second would be love. And in this, Paul is talking to Timothy um, about the love that Lois 
had for Eunice. So I think it's time to talk a little bit about Lois. And full disclosure, my mother's name is Lois. And I'm sure she's very excited about this sermon because in her mind... It's for her. It's for her. It is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we knew there was a danger. We chose, we were like, Nana's going to be over the top today. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh-huh. So we know that Eunice, Lois's daughter, runs off and meets a Greek man. And I like to think it was like on spring break. And they saw each other from a distance. And it was love. love And they came home and she's like, here's my love of my life, this Greek man. Well, Lois had a really big decision to make because she could say, well, that's fine for you, but I'm going to put you out of my household. But we know that Lois and Eunice were together and that Lois continued to love Eunice through this process of her being ostracized by the Jewish community, which also meant that Lois would have been as well. I mean, we can kind of make that guess. And so that would have changed everything for her life. But, you know, she chose to love her child no matter what. And from... Like, think about this. Like, even in today, there's this, like, you you watch TV shows or whatever, there's this archetype of the Jewish mom, right? Oh, if you watch Mrs. Maisel... Right. It's, you totally get it. I mean, there's, there's yes. this, like, there's this idea, and shows up in media and culture of, like, the Jewish mom who wants her child to do nothing more than to find another Jewish partner and settle down for life. I mean, that comes from a long tradition that would have been strong for yes. Lois. Like, all she wanted was for Eunice to meet someone nice, to settle down, had to lead a nice Jewish life, and that's not what she chose. She brought home a Greek boy. Right. Yes. And then they had a child, Timothy. Right. And so, you know, for me, it reminds me that we are called to love our kids no matter what. Now, for me personally, it has been a difficult thing because neither one of my children can shoot a jump shot. (laughs) Now, I know some of you are like, that's ridiculous, but I was a very big basketball player. I come from a basketball family. And I was a coach. I just assumed that I would have a child who would be the star point guard or maybe a power forward. I mean, you're not super tall, I know, but I think (laughs) think they could have done it. And yet they didn't choose that route. And I have had to learn to love them no matter what. (laughs) And... What we know as parents is when our kids don't necessarily take the journey that we wish for them, we have to love and support and get behind the things that they truly do love. And, and we really see this with Lois and Eunice. Well, but you have found yourself uh, doing makeup for theater and you would have never... I watched a YouTube video on how to learn how to do it. Yeah, I mean, so yes. you, I mean, like, I've, I've watched you do this with our daughters. And it's like, fine, Dave. Not everybody has to hit the winning shot for the state finals and have their picture on the front of the paper. It's fine. <laughs> she was leading the school play. Uh, yeah, but, uh, she was. It's fine. <laughs> but, you know, I do think there's that sense of when you love your kids, no matter what, it gives them that foundation of love. It gives them confidence and power. And then comes the third word, which is self-discipline. Now, Jane and I were talking about this, we were like, power and love, self-discipline, like, you know, like, it's not the most exciting word, right? But for Paul, it's a huge word. He, he talks about discipline all the time, because he compares the, the Christian walk to, like, a race, and, and how uh, athletes have to train for a race. In fact, to Timothy, at the end of this letter, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. So discipline for Paul is deeply important. But I want to be clear about what he means by discipline, because it's not like how we think of self-discipline, which is, you know, I'm not going to eat that donut that's in the, you know, the, the office uh, workspace. But, but rather, discipline, the Greek word is, I'm not going to pronounce it well. Go ahead and put it on the screen. Sophronismos. I love it when you speak Greek. <laughs> the Greek god coming out. Sophro- <laughs> Sophronismos. Uh, so it's a word that's really hard to translate into English. You can see by the, you know, the slide there that uh, it's commonly is, is known as prudence or having a sound mind, good judgment. So it's really not about like resisting temptation, although it does have a sense of integrity to it, but it's really about uh, making good decisions. Uh, I, I love how William Barclay defines it. It's, it's being in control of oneself in times of panic or passion. So the idea is as things get more and more heated around you, 
Instead of being reactive and contributing to all the chaos, instead of being calm and collected, being able to make wise choices and decisions in those moments. That's what Paul wishes for Timothy, to have a good head on his shoulders. Isn't that what we want for our kids, just to have good heads on their shoulders? And so you put these three together, Paul wishes for Timothy, power, love, and self-discipline. You know, and I, and I think, gosh, as a pastor, I can speak to how important it is to have a foundation of confidence, love that pours out for others, self-discipline to, you know, to g- good judgment in times of crisis and chaos. And, and, and I think they apply to basically any arena, you know, your home, your work. Try taking those words, power, love, self-discipline into it. And, and, and Paul says, these gifts belong to, you know, Timothy, but to really to all of us through the laying on of hands. They come through the Spirit. But we've made the argument, and I think it's true that it's not just that they came through the laying out of hands, but they were present in Timothy's character and life because of the ministry, because of the witness of his mother and his grandmother. You know, he could respond with patience and gentleness to others because think how often he would have seen his mom, his grandmother, have to respond with patience and gentleness to those who were being exclusive to them, those who were whispering about him, saying, mean, think of that. He saw that witness again and again and again, and that's what enabled him to live that out as he led the church. And so here's how we want to kind of wrap things up, I guess, is, is I just want to ask Jamelin, like, you know, these were things that we see in Timothy's life. You know, what were the things that when you think about your mother and your grandmothers that were words that you would think, the gifts they gave to you? Well, when I think about each one of them, the word that I think about is generosity. So my um, grandma Pei, my dad's mom, um, she was very generous with her time. She made quilts for all of us through the years. Almost every Christmas we would get a full quilt and she, she, she did them by hand. Um, the quilt tops, and she was a really good listener. She gave us the gift of generosity, of time just to sit and listen to us. The people around her community used to tell her everything. She said, I'm the vault. I know everything that's going on here. (laughs) And she was very generous with her time when it came to cooking meals for us. She didn't own a microwave, so like, and she didn't own an air fryer, so like everything she cooked was on the stove and took time and and gave us a lot of love through the meals she made for us every Sunday. Um, My grandma, Rain, was very generous through um, gifts. She would give you the shirt off her back, even if you didn't ask for it, and she just thought you needed it. Um, One year for my birthday, for my 13th birthday, she wadded up dollar bills as like the tissue paper and the box 13, and then this past birthday for Margaret, my mom wrapped her present in $17 bills, and mom had no memory of grandma ever doing that for me. I thought that was a progressive commercial in and of itself. (laughs) Um, And then my mom is very generous with friendship. She doesn't know who's family, who's not. She loves being a nana. She loves um, being helpful with people. I remember growing up, our door was never locked. I never knew who was going to show up for dinner or be at my house when I came home. And sometimes they were my own friends. She was always everyone's emergency contact. Um, And so she has been very generous through the years with her friendship. Yeah, and even now, it's like how many grandparents day, you know, school lunches does she go to that yeah. for kids who aren't her grandkids. She just, right. you know. And she'll eventually ask when she should come for Thanksgiving as well. So <laughs> you have to be careful. But what about you? Um, the word that comes to my mind for my parent, my, my mom, my grandmother's is strength. Um, so granny, who's on the far right there, um, her mom died when she was young. That's my mom's mom, granny. And her mom died when she was young. And so she was the oldest sibling and she became the caretaker for all of her siblings. And when her mom, re, or when her dad remarried for her step-siblings as well. Um, the story goes, uh, she married my grandfather, Pop, who lived next door. And so on the night of their wedding night, her, one of her little siblings uh, was crying out for her because she wouldn't go to bed without Granny reading her the bedtime story. So on her wedding night, my grandmother crossed over the yard, went back into you know her home, read bedtime stories to her her little sisters, and then came back over. Like that's, she's just, she, but she had this strength to kind of care for everyone. 
And then grandmama over on the far left, um, uh, she, was a, she also had the strength to kind of hold our family together. Um, she was married, I never knew my grandfather, uh, but there's tons of stories about him because he was the life of the party. He managed the only restaurant in town and he was also an alcoholic. And, uh, and Grand Rama took care of the family, but also faithfully prayed and loved my, prayed for and loved my grandfather until late in life he became a Christian and uh, became sober. Um, and, and then my mom in the middle uh, lost my dad when she was 34, had two kids, six and eight to raise, and not only raised us, but got her master's degree and had a great career and volunteered in the community and the church and never missed soccer games and, you know, piano recitals. And I honestly don't know how she all did it. And I think all of them just had this incredible strength that uh, they've passed on to me. Which I would, when he was telling me this, I said, well, that's how I would describe you. Very steady, you know, always keeping things under control. I mean, I do too, but, <laughs> but you do as well, so. <laughs> we each bring very, I mean, you know, that's the, that's the beauty. Each I remember gifts. the towels. Yes, you remember the towels. So um, I, you know, I, I think the thing that when, it, when Jane said this, you know, like that, that they each had the strength to hold the family together, I realized it was, she wasn't saying, oh, Dave, you hold the family together. Really, I was thinking about um, the church and how we live in a time where we're kind of going in every direction, being pulled in, and I'm relying on my strength that's been given to me to try to hold us all together. And that didn't come from me, it comes from my mom and my grandmother's, uh, which is a point of connection for me with Timothy, because we don't know anything about his dad's, except that his dad was Greek, so we're left to assume he was raised by his mom and his grandmother's. His faith, his sense of identity and purpose was formed by them, and, and I feel the same way, that. I'm following my father's footsteps as a pastor, but I stand in the faith of my mother and my grandmothers. So as we close, I want to just acknowledge that um, not everyone has had a great experience with mothers. I know this day can be difficult for many people, um, but I want to, and so in that space, I want to honor those who have stepped into the gap in our lives. I know for me, I had... Um, A neighbor, her name's Pixie, who was like a second mom to me. And um, I had one of my best friends, his mom's name is Terry, and she was a home away from home for me in high school and in college. And they really helped me um, during different times when, you know, there's certain conversations you need other people to talk to. And then I know you talked about Miss Louise, who was like a grandma for you. And Miss Amy, you can tell he's from the South and I'm not. All of his folks are Miss. Miss, yeah. (laughs) Um, Miss Amy, who is his best friend's mom. Um, And so it's those kind of people who come into our lives and fill the gaps for sure. So we have three questions for you we want you to consider a little bit of homework. The first one is... So the first one is, the same way Jamel and I put a word to the gift, the legacy that we had received, we would encourage you. What gift has your mother or your grandmother given to you? Put a word to it. And if your mother or grandmother is still alive, consider on this day, Mother's Day, sharing that with them and saying, you know, I thank you for giving me blank. Sorry you don't get to do it in a sermon like we did. Um, (laughs) That's a check for us. Check for us. We got that done. All right. (laughs) The second question is, who is someone outside your family who nurtured your faith and your heart and who helped fill that gap. So if there's someone, send them a quick text and let them know or an email or a card or a flying pigeon, whatever you need to do. Yeah, say, you know, on this Mother's Day, we thank you for being, you know, second mom to me. And then the third piece is this. Paul has a purpose in writing this to Timothy, which is he tells them, so don't neglect the gift, but instead fan it into flame. And so how can you take whatever gifts you've received and how do you fan those to flame to share them with others uh, so that hope, hopefully someday someone will be looking back on the gifts you left, the investment you made in their life, and, uh, and they'll be able to name uh, perhaps a gift that didn't come from you but came through you from those who've come before. So we're going to close in prayer and then we're going to sing our closing song. If you don't mind, uh, just join me in a word of prayer as we close. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the legacy of faith 
for all those through whom that faith has reached us, through our mothers and our dads and our grandmothers and our granddads, through all those second moms and second dads who filled in the gaps in our lives, and for those who came before them dating all the way back to Timothy and Eunice and Lois, we thank you for the gifts of power, love, and self-discipline which come through your spirit. Help us to kindle the flame of these gifts and all the gifts we've received and to pass them on to the glory of your Son and the healing of the world. This we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kim King, and I am the pastor of Wellness and Worship here at Zionsville UMC. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to get to know you more and spend some time with you. If you'd like to know more about our faith community, please visit our church website at zumc.org. There you'll find the many ministry opportunities we have to offer. If you need to contact one of our staff members, all our contact information is at the bottom of all the church web pages. You can also connect with us via social media throughout your week for daily inspiration and community. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube under the username Zionsville UMC. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope you have a wonderful week.